um, was a was a report that is the was we call the community report on how to end displacement in San Jose. That's what's pictured here. Um, tenant preferences have been prioritized consistently by community groups and stakeholders. Maybe some of you are among them. And so for these reasons, we included uh, anti-displacement tenant preferences into our citywide anti-displacement strategy that the city council adopted in 2020. We also made sure to include this work into our new housing element for um, that goes through the year 2031 as one of the required programs that supports fair housing um, in the program work plan that we have developed. And we're waiting to hear back that hopefully the state is, is um, signing off on our current version, but we're still waiting to hear back. And then finally, um, this effort was informed by other cities that had put in place preferences. We have spoken to Oakland and San Francisco about the tenant preferences that they have in place. Um, you know, many jurisdictions uh, adopt some form of tenant preferences some more thoughtfully than others, frankly. Um, and we've been trying to learn from the two big cities and really think through um, how to do this in a way that meets fair housing law. Next, section, next slide. Fair housing refers to policies and actions that prevent discrimination, expand choices, and address racial and economic disparities in housing. It involves both increasing investment in underserved communities and fostering inclusive neighborhoods throughout the city. Um, fair housing law is interesting because it prevents discrimination against protected class category people, but it also protects against discrimination for um, some groups that we would like to help explicitly. So we have to be careful when we do this work and do analysis to make sure that we can make all the findings that what we wanna do is legal. So staff has been conducting um, analysis, quantitative analysis, as to what our proposed preference structures would do to, um, to concentrations of race, racial or ethnic groups in the city. And we also were looking not just at race and ethnicity, but other protected class categories, including disability, uh, the size of the family, women headed, uh, heads of households, um, veteran status, and also seniors. So we had to do this <laughs> extensive uh, analysis to make sure that our proposals did not violate anybody's rights. And um, for the anti-displacement preference, which we'll define in a minute, and then for uh, preference regarding people wanting to stay hyper-local to where they live now, the neighborhood preference, uh, we looked at impacts at a one mile radius, a two mile radius, and at a council district level for all race and ethnicities. So, um, so first picture or first point, we have to do a lot of analysis to make this go forward. Unfortunately, we can't do whatever we'd like to do. Uh, it's not quite that easy. Um, the second step is talking to the state Department of Housing and Community Development um, to see if they will accept our preferences for use on um, developments that they subsidize. Uh, that is going to um, parallel track our bringing this forward to our decision makers. Um, and, and we'll hope that they sign off sooner or later. But in the meantime, we got tired of waiting for them. We are doing our work and proceeding. Um, while we are doing our work, we co-sponsored uh, state legislation together with Somos Mayfair and the Housing Action Coalition um, called Senate Bill 649. And it was introduced in 2021. It was signed by the governor happily in 2022. And what the bill does is makes it easier for property owners to make findings that it is okay to set aside a portion of units and serve a population other than the general public for this population that really did not have formal policy underpinnings, as they say before. There aren't any funding programs for people who are at risk of displacement specifically. And so our lawyers told us the best way to get this done would be to float a bill and get it passed. And we that's actually what we did. So it's kind of amazing. Um, communities all throughout the state now will be able to serve uh, residents at risk of displacement 
and they can define it their own ways and um, make those projects eligible for using uh, tax credit financing and tax exempt bond financing. So we have that legislative piece in place. And um, now our job is to bring forward um, proposals that are informed by the general public, uh, property owners, you know, property managers, all kinds of stakeholders, and do a formal approval process ending with council approval. So that is the path that we are on. And we'll talk about timeline in our next step slide right at the end. And next slide. This is an overview map of San Jose. Hopefully you can see this okay. The city council district outlines are indicated in brown. The colored census tracts are taken from the University of California Berkeley Urban Displacement Project maps and of San Jose specifically. Um, they have a methodology that looks at population changes over time and then ranks the census tracts in terms of how risky they are for displacement. So that you see the, the tracts that are colored in orange are defined as those that are definitively experiencing displacement of households that are extremely low income and very low income. The tracts in red are ones that the model indicates are definitively experiencing displacement um, of households that are extremely low, very low and low income. And then the peach or the pinkish areas are those that are probably experiencing displacement. So it's residents living in these areas that we wanna prioritize um, if they do apply to move into affordable housing properties. And so um, we are using this model as a third party kind of um, framework and relying on that and creating our preferences around that. Now I'm gonna hand it over to Josh Ishimatsu to describe the two preferences more carefully. Josh. Hi again, everybody. Um, as I said before, uh, I'm Josh Ishimatsu, he, him, and I'm, the, I'm, a, I'm with the policy team for the City of San Jose Housing Department. So as Kristen talked about, tonight we're presenting the, city, the Housing Department's proposal for tenant preferences. Um, these tenant preferences would apply to city-supported affordable housing and require owners of this housing to prioritize a defined portion of units for people who qualify for the preferences. And so tonight we're really talking about our two proposed preferences. So the first one um, is the citywide anti-displacement tenant preference. So this preference would be for lower income households who currently live in neighborhoods which the city categorizing categorizes as having high risk of displacement where displacement is happening. And so that's the map that we were just looking at. Um, you know, the, the pink, the orange, and the reddish orange places of the map. That's what we're talking about. And so the goal here with this preference is to increase the likelihood of people who are at risk of displacement that they would have access to affordable homes and be able to stay in the, in the city of San Jose. Uh, next slide, please. So the second preference is a neighborhood tenant preference. And this preference would apply to lower income households who currently live or live at the time of the, that they're applying uh, in the same city council district as the building that they are applying to live in, is an affordable housing building that they're applying to live in. So here, the goal of the preference is to increase the likelihood that people would be able to stay in their current neighborhood, that they'd be able to get affordable housing in their current neighborhood. Um, next slide, please. So um, so just, just kind of to sum up between those two slides, the, eligib the eligibility for the two preferences would be lower income San Jose residents. So this would be a, for a family of four, this would be um, a household that makes less than $145,000 for the whole household. Um, so it would be these residents who, for the anti-displacement preference, live in the, the neighborhoods um, that we showed in the map earlier, the census tracts where displacement is happening or at risk of happening. Um, for the neighborhood preference, 
it would be again people who live in the same council district as an affordable housing you know we're, we're in affordable housing where the prospective affordable housing is located uh, next slide so as i mentioned um, these tenant preferences would apply to city supported affordable housing where there is some form of legal binding agreement about the affordability between the city and the owner of the housing. Um, for existing already, already operating affordable housing properties, the preference would have to be negotiated on a deal by deal basis. And usually that that's when, you know, refinanced or some uh, when they come back to the city for some, you know, for some benefit to the housing project. Um, the, the preferences would apply to units that are only apply to units that are open to the general lower income population, including affordable senior units. Um, however, uh, I don't know if we have any developers in the room, um, but we had a couple that were on the, um, who RSVP'd on the interest list. So um, we would not expect uh, developer owners to apply the preferences where there would be other requirements from other funders, or there would be other superseding preferences on the units. Um, for properties that are all that are not already operating as affordable housing, but would be developed as affordable housing, uh, we'd be looking to apply the preferences to all city supported affordable housing properties that are in development by or after the effective date of the approved ordinance. Uh, next slide, please. So the preferences would apply to 35% of the restricted affordable units that would otherwise be available to the general lower, lower income population, as I described in the previous slide. Um, this would be split into 15% of the units for the neighborhood preference and 20% of the units for the anti-displacement preference. Um, here, here um, I should note that there are a couple legal reasons why we're proposing 35%, the total of 35% um, for the two preferences combined. Um, the first reason is based on our city attorney's interpretation of case law regarding, regarding tenant preferences. For fair housing law, as Christian had touched upon, you know, we can't create a system um, that that where there's an unfair advantage for one group or another. Um, and there have been other preferences, tenant preferences implemented around the country. And some of these have been challenged in court. Um, and based on his read of these court cases, uh, our, our city attorney has told us that this percentage of units seems reasonable. And the second reason is our own disparate impact analysis. So this is the statistical quantitative analysis that Kristen talked about, you know, that we had to do before we could even, you know, figure out how to propose what these preferences were. So this is a fair housing statistical test to see how a preference might change the demographic composition of a building and whether the estimated impact of the preference is statistically significant. Um, so as Christian mentioned, we ran statistical tests of lots of different possible preference scenarios. And this 35% level is the mix and, and the mix between the two is what we could get is what we could get to pass this the disparate impact test, the statistic, the statistical analysis um, across the city. So this is something that you know we tested in, in every council district. Um, next slide, please. So um, implementation. So if the city council approves tenant, our proposal for tenant preferences, um, in order to implement tenant preferences, the housing department would integrate tenant preferences into doorways, which is an online um, application. It's, a, it's an app or a website. Um, it's available in both those forms that allows people to apply to affordable housing across the city of San Jose. Um, 
So you can access Doorway on your phone or a computer, and Doorway would incorporate information about the preferences um, based on an applicant's address that, that they'd be able to enter, and it would tell you if you were eligible for a preference for a given property. Um, the housing department would work with affordable housing owners and developers to modify existing loan agreements or to put into new loan, loan agreements uh, language, which would uh, require, them to require them to implement the preferences. And then the city would also create a manual for affordable housing property managers on how to implement and manage the preferences. Uh, next slide, please. So once the preferences are, are up and running, um, property managers would implement the preference by, um, through doorway, they would receive a list of applicants identifying you know, which, which of those applicants would be eligible for what preference based upon the current address of the application and the address of the um, affordable housing development. Um, property managers would apply the preferences to 35% 35, 35 of the applicable units, as, as I described. Um, and, you know, the, they would qualify all tenants, um, including those who are eligible for one or both preferences. Um, next slide, please. So uh, as far as implementation, once once the preferences are, are up and running, potential applicants would apply for a property that they're interested in that is accepting applications. And this could be through doorway, which will have which has functionality that would be that to be translated into uh, Spanish, Vietnamese, and Chinese, or it could be through a paper application, paper application uh, submitted directly to the to the um, to the property. Um, applicants once the you know applicants will be required to from to provide some form of evidence of their elig eligibility. Um, this could be a vi wide variety of different sort of uh, proof of address or, you know, um, things like that, you know, utility bills, you know, there, there are lots of different ways to, to be able to, to be able to document your eligibility. Um, and applicants would be able to opt out of the preference should they choose. And would be, and then, you know, if you're up, if you opt in and qualify for the preference, then you'd be placed upon the property manager's list for um, qualified tenant preferences. Um, so I will now pass the presentation to Avni. Great, thank you, Josh. So in terms of engagement and education, um, post adoption of the of the program, uh, we would like to create materials for community distribution. This includes uh, community partners um, and target locations such as public sites uh, like libraries and city buildings and affordable housing sites. We also plan to hold information sessions with property managers post adoption. We've been having uh, continual discussions with property managers currently and hope to continue those discussions afterwards. Um, and we will make community presentations at or near new affordable sites so folks know about the preferences. And so this is, these are some of our next steps. Right now, summer and fall, we are holding public meetings and making presentations to stakeholders. We'll revise the framework based on feedback. Um, September through December, we're presenting to public bodies. So this, uh, the draft framework will go to the Housing and Community Development Commission on September 14th, and then the Community and Economic Development Committee on October 23rd, and then subsequently the full city council. By the end of the calendar year, we'll have integrated the tenant preferences into the online affordable housing portal doorway and so those will be ready to go online as well. So I'm going to stop screen share for a moment. We're in the uh, discussion and Q&A portion. And so just as a reminder, please be respectful. Mute yourself if you aren't speaking. And then um, raise your hand or type in your question in the chat. 
So I'm gonna go ahead and stop share. Heather, can you enable the chat, please? Yes. Hi, Danny. I see that you have your hand raised. Go ahead. Uh, you know, in in uh, in our area on Allen Rock Avenue, of course, uh, we're going to have development coming up and down Allen Rock Avenue from King to Jackson. Uh, Foss Avenue is already built. Charities Housing is building theirs right now. So I would hope that we could get uh, maybe someone coming to Plata Royal and Mayfair for sure. And and as as things move forward, that that they come to uh, our neighborhood association meetings, and uh, you know people know where we're at, and they know how to get in touch with us. With us, thank you. Thank you, Danny. Great. I see a question in the chat. So what size buildings will this apply to? Will this apply to buildings that are less than 15 units, ones with no on-site manager? Um, this would apply to, by size of building, it would apply to any building that is receiving City of San Jose support. Um, and and uh, you know, it's it doesn't matter the size of the building. It's what what matter what it's what's important is that the that there's city of San Jose support for the building and that it's it's affordable housing that is um, reserved for you know income restricted affordable housing. Great, thank you, Josh. I see, Maria has a question. Do people who don't have a social number? I think that means social security number, would they be able to qualify for these opportunities? If I could comment, um, yes. Uh, actually, people who do not have a social security number may still always apply to restricted affordable housing. And um, the rules are that the property managers are supposed to work with you to allow alternative documentation. So I want everyone to spread the word if uh, if you're interested in that, that should not be an impediment to getting into affordable housing in general, and nor should it be any problem in applying for a tenant preference as you, you know, and showing where you live now as you do apply for, for a slot in an apartment. Thank you, Kristen. All right, Annie um, also has a question. Are LIHTC's low-income housing tax credit properties counted as city-supported and would fit under the tenant preference program? In and of itself, if if it's only if it's only receiving tax credits and not some form of city funding, um, it would not count. But uh, almost every almost every property that's going to receive city funded. Uh, city city support will also be um also have the low income housing tax credits so if i can add you know the important thing again is that the city is acting as a lender um if the city is simply passing through bond financing with no city loan our lawyer has said no um it's when we act as a lender that we have a little bit more control and implementing our policy priorities. So that'll be our task on a deal by deal basis to make sure that our staff communicates with each property owner and property management company to make sure they understand are your unit subject for the preference. Great, thank you. Okay, so Jose, uh, has a question about the set aside percentage, the uh, the percentage uh, this would apply to. Can you discuss the metrics used to reach the thirty five percent of total units as tenant preference so for the tenant preference program? What is what is statistically significant 
that 35% saturation does not create negative impacts to non-extremely low income renters. So, so um, I can t I can try to take this one. The it's not about negative impacts to non ELI or non extremely low income renters. Really, what it's about is, um, gosh. So, um, what we're what the what the statistic test is about is how much how different the composition of the building would be, the demographic composition of the building would be with or without the preference. And um, and to look at whether or not the, the um, change in the compos demographic composition of the building for those specified protected classes is outside of an 80% sort of statistical confidence interval. So um, it just depends on how, how different, if we're looking at race as an example, you know, how different would the racial composition of the building end up being if we, if we looked at it statistically with or without the preference? Um, so it's like we don't want to increase um, the 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 presence of certain you know uh, people based on what what their membership in a protected class um, and that could be disability that could be that could be um, you know that could be about you know household size or or female headed household uh, we don't we just don't want it to to benefit um or burden anybody more or less than 80 percent of the statistical test um if that makes it if that makes sense i hope that's helpful. we're all turning into statistics majors now yeah i just want to say like it's it's trying to just kind of draw um causation like how likely is this kind of statistical outcome likely to happen by accident or just you know one out of a hundred times like just by chance versus something that was much less likely to have happened by chance and so anyway the um the that is the analysis as josh really well described it um just trying to make sure that we're not doing anything um that is not legally substantiated to discriminate against any particular group, right? That's that's our job. And I'll just say one other thing, that's the public sector's job, um, you know, and I think private owners are probably held to a little bit lower test and a little bit lower level of, um, you know, focus on something like this, but this is the best practice to do the analysis the way that uh, San Francisco is doing it. And um, it's kind of, it's what the state actually told us to do as well. Thanks. Great, thank you. And we conducted three different tests. I don't know what, how to turn this up, Sarah. What did you do? Nope, sounds like someone needs to mute. Right. You muted. Uh, I, so the next question from Jose is, are there any potential planning incentives, i.e. density bonuses contemplated so market rate developers can also implement similar tenant preferences? Kristen, would you like to take this? Question? Yeah, I'll take a stab at this. Um, when market rate developers include affordable units in their properties, Either under our either under our inclusionary housing ordinance, or maybe using a state law like the density bonus, um, and the city has its own ordinance effectuating the state law, but it's the same thing. Um, that no, because that stops short of the city's ability to act as a lender and therefore ask for more um, than what is just allowed under law. Density bonus is allowed by right under law. If the developer provides X number of affordable units, they get to choose from a, an array of, um, of not waivers, but concessions basically. And so are alternatives. So that's their right under law. And so we, 
that's a good example of a time where we would not have the ability as a lender to go in and say, hey, do you also want to do this thing that we think is important? So unfortunately not. Now, under our inclusionary housing ordinance, maybe at some point, yes. Um, but we would have to do the outreach on that. And um, we had not done that previously. And so at this point, um, we're, we're just moving forward with deals that we're on as a lender. Thank you, Kristen. Jose, uh, I saw your comment about uh, reading the analysis. Um, it isn't posted yet, but we will post the analysis on the tenant preferences webpage. Uh, thank you. Okay, so um, next question I think is from Danny. Can you explain the not included examples on page 16 briefly, please? So, so that's the slide number 16. Yeah. Um, maybe maybe uh, somebody could share the slides again and go to 16 just so we could just so we could talk through that. Um, and I just cited one of the instances on there, the inclusionary housing ordinance deals only. Um, that and why it would not be allowed because we're not acting as a lender. Josh, you want to keep going with this other stuff? Sure. So, um, so the first bullet, uh, units for special populations, and the example there is um, permanent supportive housing. So that's when those units are, um, it's like eligibility is determined and managed. The queue, the, the waiting list is managed by the county. So it's not um, it's not something that the that the city you know sh would be able to take control of. Um, so uh, inclusionary housing, Christian just talked about it. Uh, units subject only to the city bond regulatory agreement. This is kind of inside baseball, um, but this is you know there's a um, there's like a tax exempt uh, bond which can be used for certain types of affordable housing. Um, the city participates in it, but the 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 funds actually flow through a um, a bank lender or a financial institution. So in that case, the city wouldn't have the the same sort of leverage that you know that as Kristen was talking about. You know, to be able to in to be able to require uh, um, to be able to require a developer or owner to implement the preferences. Um, HUD funded, HUD funded properties. So um, right now, this one I think we can work on. Um, we can talk more to to HUD about this, but um, I don't think we'll be doing that, Josh. <laughs> well, um, but at any rate, the um, the uh, uh, county um, or the I, I'm sorry, the 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 Santa Clara County Housing Authority um, as a as you know they can they sort of um, manage the project based section eight, which is a HUD funded program, um, which which generally goes has been used to go into um, permanent supportive housing, um, but according to their attorneys, um, HUD does not like preferences that are smaller than the city limits of a city, so um, so that for for them to say neighborhood or to say um, a census tract where that's at risk where the you know, where displacement is happening is not something that HUD would approve of. Um, so units restricted over 80% AMI. So this would be sort of like moderate income or middle income housing, uh, which which actually the city doesn't, doesn't um, support very much of and anyways, but um, you know, we set up eligibility eligibility to be under 80% AMI or lower income. So this is just a, this bullet is just a case where um, it doesn't, it doesn't sort of like overlap with the, with the way that we've designed the preference or the, you know, so it's, it mm -hmm. just wouldn't be eligible. Um, and then unrestricted mm -hmm. units, um, you know, it's units where it's not affordable mm -hmm. housing or, you know, so that's mm -hmm. just more broadly, yeah, um, where are your phone? It would have ringing? to be affordable housing that, that this would have been. Seven's to. trying to reach you.
Thank you, Josh. And just as a reminder, if you can put yourself on mute, that'd be great. Um, all right, so uh, Laksh says, good evening. Thank you for the presentation. I live near downtown San Jose and I'm in general support of both of these forms of preferences. And then on the displacement preference, I think it's also important to listen to the community as you define and implement this. For example, besides considering residents currently living in high displacement census tracts, could this preference include those who have been displaced from San Jose in the past, either in those census tracts or due to rising rents? And could it include other residents who are being evicted under the Ellis Act or other no-fault evictions as in San Francisco's law? So I believe this is uh, talking about a displaced household preference. Um, Kristen or Josh, do you want to talk about our plans to address this? Yeah, thank you. And thank you for your comments, Laksh. Um, you know, you are saying something that we have heard many times in the community um, as we have done this work. And um, we are in agreement with you. We do want to pursue a displaced person's tenant preference. That is the next preference to be developed right after we hopefully get these approved by the city council. Um, and why we we wanted to proceed with the anti-displacement preference first, because it is very clearly uh, in accordance with fair housing law. The making all the findings for the anti-displacement preference, really easy. Um, takes a lot of work, but really clean on the data side. The neighborhood preference was more challenging, but we heard very clearly from our many of our east side residents that they thought neighborhood um, was very important as a concept. And so we tackled that next. Um, and so the displaced person's preference would have different mm, facts that a resident would have to show. So, and um, Laksh actually mentions one, or two that we have in mind as well. So if anybody, um, so for instance, tenants being evicted under the Ellis Act, the Ellis Act is a state law that says if there's, an, a, if there's a rent stabilized building that gets taken off the market, um, that whatever replaces it actually has to build affordable units, uh, commensurate with what got, dis what got torn down and it has to give residents um, from before an opportunity to move back. As an example, um, the city's ordinance also says some other things, but yes, if there was a site where uh, apartment rent ordinance uh, building was torn down, yes, that would be a displacing event. And as an example, that resident would come to the property manager and show their address. The city would have to furnish the property managers with the address of the displaced, you know, the unit, the Ellis Act um, demolition, as an example. But there are many different kinds of displacements, as Laksh was also noting, and each one would have its own evidence that the resident would have to show. And, um, and then the legal findings about why this is warranted are more complicated, and we would have to think it through further. So, but yes, that is the next one that we are working on. Thanks, Kristen. And Laksha, I see that you had a question about the neighborhood preference as well, suggesting that we consider a half mile radius around a development. Um, you're saying this would allow for integration of fair housing outside of council district boundaries, as San Francisco does. So I'm going to start us off, and Josh, feel free to continue. Um, we conducted the disparate impact analysis with the half mile radius around a property, one mile and two mile. And unfortunately, in the half mile radius analysis, we were unable to meet the fair housing requirements, we were unable to pass a few of the tests to ensure that we are meeting that 80% selection requirement. Um, and so we broadened it and broadened it and the council districts um, allowed us to meet the fair housing requirements so that we were selecting um, a variety of folks uh, with the preference and not over or under selecting any, any one particular group. So that's why we did it that way. Um, and then I also see, so I, I don't know if you want to add anything else to that, Josh. Well, I, I'll just say that, like, you know, really what's important is the number of people that fits into the geographic area that you're that you're limiting your preference to, uh, because like 
in order to in order to pass the test you need more people and and the thing is like with san francisco it's a more densely populated city so um when you have a smaller radius in san francisco you get more people into that so it's but like um you know the same size radius in the city of san jose doesn't bring in as many it doesn't have the same population base so it becomes harder for for the test to pass especially if you're running the test throughout the city so um i mean i think that's it's just it's just it's just harder for us to for us in san jose to to pass with a with a small with a smaller radius yeah and i'll just add one other thing it the tests really matter as to exactly what your neighborhoods look like racially and ethnically. And, and while San Jose is very diverse in general, we actually have spatial concentrations of certain races and ethnicities. And so when that happens, you can imagine that if somebody who, um, so for instance, Japantown, we built affordable housing for seniors in Japantown. We didn't build it, we subsidized it and First Community Housing built it. And, um, you know, you can imagine that some people would have been upset if the only folks that got prioritized for a uh, tenancy with a, a even larger proportion of units were folks living right there in Japantown. Why? Because you'd end up with a property that was largely Japanese descent, which um, is good for that group, but not good for the other groups, right? So, um, so the characteristics of our neighborhoods really matters. And um, and so actually the same kind of thing that could pass in San Francisco, as Josh said, maybe because their density of people living per block is different, um, couldn't pass in San Jose, um, given our exact characteristics. So this is really, really place dependent. And then I see, Avni, if it's okay, I'll just comment. I see two comments. Um, both from Locks and Jeremy about can't you raise the 35% number to 40? Um, you know, we started out with our attorney at 30% and then we cajoled him up to getting comfortable with 35. Um, there's actually a court case about a property, I think it's in New York, that had a 50% preference. And that was clearly deemed not okay by the courts, that it was such a large proportion of the property. It was really hard to make the findings that you were kind of having a minimal impact on units available to the general public. Um, as soon as you start going north of 35, the legal support for the program and um, starts to ebb in terms of, uh, of opinions. There aren't that many opinions out there on these um, but we really don't need to be sued on this. And so we are, we're going to release it with a 35% set aside. And I'm super glad that we're all comfortable and that the analysis worked with 35 because it might not work with 40 either. Again, super place specific, very data dependent. And if I can just add, we, we did try to do the analysis with the 40% set aside. And unfortunately it didn't work everywhere. <laughs> I didn't realize you were doing some of that. <laughs> yeah, we, we tested it out. Um, and so I think what we hope to do is start with this number and we'll have to update our disparate impact analysis periodically regardless. And so as we get new data about the composition uh, you know, about neighborhoods and how the tests pass, um, we hope to go ahead and be able to to uh, be responsive to that. Yeah, new data and new, and like as the legal conditions change, as whatever conditions change, um, if we're able to change it, we we want to be able to, to be able to change it, to increase it. Um, so but, that's, yeah. I, I mean, it, it, it's, I mean, you know, we, we want to do, and at the same time, you know, we have to make sure that we're doing something that's, that's, um, that's not going to get the city sued, developers, affordable right. housing developers sued. Um, right. So we, we have to, and that, you know, that's part of our responsibility as city staff is to, um, is to look at the legal liability. Um, and, you know, we have, we have a whole team of attorneys employed by the city to 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 protect the city from liability so that's one of the things that we just have to do
let me just add two quick things. Um, if we are lucky enough to obtain the state's approval on this, their requirement is that we have to redo all the data analysis literally every year. I have no idea how they think that we're staffed to do that kind of thing because we had to get Avni as a special fellow for one year to just focus on this work. So anyway, um, data will change over time. Our analysis will have to get refreshed over time. And so we can keep looking at that as data changes. Um, and so Jaime, hi, um, Jaime, I'm glad, I'm glad folks are here that we um, know. Uh, yeah, I think your points are um, taken. And I think also asked and answered that they have not, both of those 40% and a half mile not shown to be uh, in compliance with fair housing. Thanks, Kristen. Um, I see Mia, you had a question about this uh, meeting being recorded. Yes, it is. And we are going to go ahead and send out the recording in a follow-up email um, that you'll receive uh, tomorrow, hopefully. Um, so I see a couple more questions here. Um, uh, I believe there was a question, there was a discussion about Quetzal Gardens just for a moment. And I'm um, just, oh yes, uh, Danny was saying HUD issue is very important because Quetzal Gardens claimed to move residents from 95116, that zip code into their building, but they did not. And they are HUD funded. Um, yeah. So. So when they were built and complete, they got people and, and, you know, they got Aruba and other organizations like Plata Royal and Mayfair to support that project. Uh, <clears throat> and then it turns out because of the, the they were going to help us fight displacement. And then they turned around and said, well, you know what? We can no longer do that because HUD won't let us. So they lied to us. They fooled us. Then <clears throat> when that came out magically, Two people from 95116 were let into the to the building. And now we just found out about a month and a half ago that there's no more people from 95116. So we have to be careful about honest, honesty, honesty, and getting our people into the projects. And of course, like I just mentioned, uh, charities housing is is coming we need to be very careful with that and don't forget what silicon sage did to the east valley also those two people now are in federal prison for securities and exchange commission violations and they wanted uh to create housing on two spots in alum rock and they also have one down over by the arena so we have to be very careful with hud if I could comment, Danny, thank you for bringing that up to our attention. Um, you know, I think some of the units in Quetzal Gardens do have a special needs population there. And I think they do have some tenant based vouchers. And that is federal funding. And yes. we're going to go back and do some more research as to whether those federal funds in the form of place based vouchers um, do, uh, I say, taint the other units that don't have them. I actually think that what the owners said are uh, resources for community development. Right. Maybe it either is accurate or there's a perception that it is accurate um, because somebody, <laughs> somebody's attorney might be saying, you know, to be risk uh, avoidant, um, that it would be safer not to. So I think it's a good research question that we are definitely looking into. That attorney, that, that attorney statement is is really, really, really good. I appreciate that because that's probably what happened. Uh, one thing I will tell you is we need veterans to be included in this because we asked Kessel Gardens for one, one unit, one unit dedicated to veterans, and they told us to get screwed. Well, you know, uh, with a special population like veterans, Danny, it, there does need to be a funding source um, behind that requirement. And the state has a funding source called the Veterans VHHP. Um, unless you have a source that makes you serve a specific population that is a protected class, it's actually right. not legal to just set aside units for protected classes that you like. That makes that makes perfect sense. Different Does that make bank. sense? Different bank. Yeah. And I just want to say the same thing that we went through in passing legislation, 
the state had to, we patterned it after a bill that acknowledged teachers could be eligible for affordable housing sponsored by school districts. And before that, there was also, there was a federal IRS de declaration that somebody sought an opinion on veterans because even though there was a program for it, there were some councils saying, you know what, that's not enough. We actually need the IRS to tell us it's okay to set aside units for veterans. And so someone had to go get an IRS opinion just to even operate the statewide program. It's loco, right? This stuff is very, uh, it is a legal subject. And actually, I just want to say again, like Josh made a really good point, which is we want to make sure we help as many people as possible to prevent them from leaving the city. At the same time, if we go too far, um, what's going to happen is it's going to basically undercut our abilities to get these preferences into as many eligible properties as possible because councils will say you're pushing it too far and I don't care what that state law says I'm not comfortable with 45 percent I'm not so it, they get to decide if we are allowed to do the preferences on every building so our jobs to like present good data clean opinion and say everything's taken care of and um and you know roll something out that everyone can get comfortable with so really interesting so in the weeds fair housing law combo i love it <laughs> thanks danny i know we have i see one more question from jaime just um he was excited to hear about or i'm sorry jaime was excited to hear about um people without social security numbers um being able to apply and qualify for the preferences um, and hopes that's true because they've heard from advocates complain that affordable housing units are not available to people without documents. Just wanted to double check and make sure we have a response to that. Yes. And um, I think Tasha had to drop off. Tasha works also for the housing department, Tasha Matos, in our asset management group. And um, Tasha uh, was a property manager at Restricted Affordable Properties. Um, before she joined the city. And um, so we, um, you know, we'll validate again um, if this is generally true. But, you know, one thing we were looking at as a policy on this was to actually make it our policy to ensure that all property managers advertise the fact that they could accept alternative documentation and that they, and basically to force the issue on our portfolio so that people knew that they could apply um, who did not have uh, social security numbers. So um, so again, as an example, if you're trying to show your that you're living somewhere and you may right now not have a written lease with your name on it, right? And so, um, but we've talked to folks and reportedly you should be able to sign an affidavit that says, I have an oral lease in place it's not written, it's oral, to sublet this room at this property. And, and that's an example of a way that somebody could create uh, more flexibility if they were trying to do that. And that's our intention is to make sure that that happens regularly. So if anybody out there gets stories where someone tried to show documentation that was alternative and didn't, it did not work, I want to hear about it that is not okay with me. So thank you for raising the issue and let's, and talking through it with us. That is something that we've heard from the community is very important. And the state agency that administers tax credits allows. So we wanna make sure it's working. Thanks. Thanks, Kristen. I think we might have time for one last question. And so I see a question from Elma. Um, uh, saying, I'm so frustrated as an Alum Rock Avenue resident, affordable housing developments are built on Alum Rock Avenue, yet the funding requirements for these developments are not serving our current residents. What is the point of approving these projects when they don't benefit our neighbors or our community? Um, Josh, do you want to take this and just describe uh, the case study that we used with the state? You mean that's all? I mean, we, yeah. So, I mean, we've we've Katsal's come up already. Um, you know, we've been talking about it this evening. Um, I mean, that's 
Quetzal is one of the driving reasons why we passed the why we worked so hard to pass the SB six four nine. Um, you know why why we're doing this. Um, and you know we we you know we agree with you that that affordable housing that's being built in a place should serve that place as well as the general public. Um, you know, it should be a resource for the people who live in the neighborhood around it. And it should be a resource for for um, everybody, but, you know, for the people who live in the neighborhood is really important. So this is something that um, that we're the reason why we're proposing this policy is to is to address this concern. And and we're doing it to the you know, we're doing it to the extent um, that that we feel is a that we feel we can yeah and i just want to add that when we sponsored the bill and we we had councils and we had lots of staff in sacramento asking why do you think this is necessary and we wrote up a case study of quetzal gardens and uh, what Danny stated is right at, at initial lease up of the units otherwise available to the general public no local residents or applicants got into the property, but upon unit turnover, two ended up getting in. That those are the facts that was we understand it as well. And after we wrote the case study up like this and showed that just playing a numbers game, even though local, um, you know, local uh, community-based organizations had worked with applicants had gotten them ready for what they needed to submit, had really done everything that they could to make sure people got into the system. It still didn't work. And actually the state who's super hard to please, very strict on these issues, because most communities, by the way, tr you know, a lot of communities try to discriminate by putting in place preferences a little bit. Um, anyway, we're trying to do the right thing. And that case study was really compelling to them. And that's why we co-sponsored the bill with Samos Mayfair um, and, and I guess CSA Party Collective kind of, and, and then, um, you know, they spoke at public hearings about this problem, that numbers alone are just not letting people get the chances that we need them to have. And that is literally why we're doing this work. And we were sorry about that outcome, but happy to have such a graphic explanation of why we need, we need this. So thanks for your thoughts on that. Thank you. So I think just to close this out, I'm going to reshare, I'm just in the chat, I'm going to reshare the links to the webpage into our email list. Um, and let me screen share again. Um, and Kristen, if you'd like to close us out, <clears throat> great. Sure. We really appreciate you coming on what I'm sure is a busy weeknight for everybody. And hopefully y'all can go get some dinner soon um, if you haven't eaten already. Uh, our email addresses are listed here. And again, if you go onto our website, um, there is a shortcut to the web page, um, which is listed here. But again, if you, um, can't remember the shortcut, um, you know, at any time, whatever, try searching for tenant preferences on the city's website. The page should come right up. We want to stay in touch with you. Um, we want to make sure that um, not only folks who have, you know, thoughts on the programs, but also may be interested in unit opportunities if they came up and properties that will accept the, the preferences. Um, one thing that we think is it could be a win-win is that, um, you know, not only being able to go onto the rental portal, if somebody that you know, or someone is looking for an affordable apartment and they would see right there that it's eligible for the tenant preferences or not, um, but also, you know, the city can try to help get the word out in case we know that there is uh, a slot or two for people who qualify for the preferences, we can help get the word out too. So if you're interested in receiving general emails about this work or receiving emails about future housing opportunities, please go onto our website, sign up for our mailing lists and, um, and we'll keep folks up to date again about the public hearings uh, process that is coming up over the next few months. 
So with that, I thank you all for coming and love that you shared your thoughts with us. We're sharing that we're saving the chat before we go. And, um, you know, feel free to reach out to us if you have more uh, questions or thoughts. And um, Omni, can you remind us, um, are there more meetings coming up that people could tell their friends to go to? Yeah, we have another meeting coming up on the 31st. It's listed on the webpage, but if you'd like to register directly, I added the link right now. Great. And we'll stay here for a couple of minutes if you need time to click on the links. Excellent. Well, with that, thank you so much for coming. Thank you also to Avni who has focused her work wholeheartedly on this initiative for the last nine, 10 months. And uh, we're so lucky to have her. So um, thank you all. And I hope you have a good evening. That was some great explanations. Wow, I can't believe you I can't believe you guys wanted those details. Yeah, we like all the time we're like great how, stuff. How how in the weeds on these things should we go? I know. Because there's so much weeds. There's so much weeds. I so, know. Danny's I mean, like, lay it on me. I mean, <laughs> we you know, were like, I want to see the numbers. We like, appreciate uh, we should like appreciate people who want to hear the details. So, so funny. Thank you. Yeah. You know, I, I appreciate you guys. You know, a lot of times people think that I'm I I hate City Hall, but actually I don't because um I I can't tell you how many times I've said, where else can I go and talk to the city manager, planning, housing? Where else can I go? Uh -huh. yeah, uh -uh. And I, I say that because I try to do it out in LA and Reno and Las Vegas, and you can't get met. So I really appreciate everything you guys do, whether whether I'm wrong or not. You know, it's an education because we're never wrong. We never lose. Right. We just get educated. <laughs> oh, I love that attitude. That's a wrestling attitude. I coach wrestling for 23 years. Oh. I, I told my kids, you never lose. You get educated. It's true. The next time they're not going to get you that way again. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I yeah. mean, you, you might get thrown by the head and arm one time, but the next time you're going to get hit with a double right to your back. So anyway. So okay, much journey. Guys, thank Danny, you. Thank you for being here and for your supportive words. We appreciate you. I love it. Take care. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. And thank you to the interpreters. We really appreciate you being here um, and the vital work that you do. So thank you. Thank you, interpreters.